Perfect. Um, right, great. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for being early. You guys are right on time for day two of Mental Health Festival Asia, um, organized by Intellect, a modern day mental health company. Um, so yeah, um, just to kind of kick off the session today, for those that were with us yesterday, you know what the agenda or, or the goal of the Mental Health Festival um, is, right? Um, but for those that are just joining in, I'll give a quick refresher. Um, the whole purpose of, of, of organizing and driving this two-day event, it's really to grow and drive awareness for mental health across Singapore, Asia, um, and the whole region in itself, where we believe there's a lot of work to be done um, for people to be more comfortable seeking support and understanding what mental health means to all of us. So we have got a great day lined up for you guys today. Um, shortly, I'll be introducing our very first speaker, uh, who's going to cover mental health of families. But before that, uh, we've got an exciting session to the uh, lined up with um, featuring local icons like Gamit Singh, um, Annette Lee and Benjamin King. We've got um, senior folks from Swiss Re, insurers like Cigna and Mercer, and a lot of other leaders from um, big companies that, that we all know and love, like Food Panda um, and the likes as well, where they will talk about their perspectives of mental health in different landscapes from the... Um, practitioner's point of view, from a professional point of view, and from the um, government point of view as well in that, in that manner. So it's, it's an exciting session. If you guys would like to see the, the lineup and agenda, do go to the website, um, festival.intellect.co slash mhfa-2021. But in the meantime, without further ado, we're going to kick off the session with the first, um, with the, with the first speaker. I'm just going to move to the next slide to introduce our first session. Right, so we are honored to have Shan Yeo, the founder of Happiness Scientists, to open the session today, to kickstart the session with a great segment. I'm just going to spotlight her screen for on mental health for families, right? So I think the, the topic of the session is going to be what are practices that, uh, for good mental health that we can do, right? And how do we talk about mental health and also for women in mental health as well? So um, I'm going to pass it over to Shan. It's a real pleasure. Shan, I'll hand over to you to, to um, start the session. Thank you, Teodori, and good morning, everybody. Super excited to be able to be here with all of you today. And judging from the response from the first day, I'm sure that day two is going to be smashing as well. Really excited to be here to share about supporting women and sort of strengthening the family. First, I want to begin with sharing with you a little bit about my background. Ten years ago, I went overseas to the University of Pennsylvania to study a Master of Applied Positive Psychology. I was driven with a main question which is how can I help myself, my family, and the community around me flourish? And through many years of pre-reading, it finally led me to the point where I uprooted my family, my husband, my 10-month-old daughter, and went all the way to UPenn to study about positive psychology. Needless to say, it was an enriching year, and I came back really excited to share the tools and research on positive psychology with literally anyone who was about who would be willing to listen to me. So ever since then, um, I've been able to share it with many, many companies and schools and individuals. Uh, one of the highlights over the last 10 years is being able to share about my own happiness journey on the TEDx stage, where I was able to share with people, you know, there are ways in which we can be happy, and a lot of it is in our hands. Much of my work that I do also involves women. So this was an event when I worked with Love Bonito to share with parents particularly new mothers on how to support their well-being, but also their children's well-being. And of course, I can't be here talking about women and the family if I don't introduce my two beautiful daughters. So my elder daughter is 12 and her name is Sherry. My younger daughter is seven and her name is Zoe. And you can see him here enjoying the traditional ice cream. We have an ice cream man who comes to our estate every Friday. And this has become our sort of PGIF ritual. Today is no exception, I'm looking forward to that. So what's on the plate for today's talk? I will be talking a little bit about the impact of the pandemic on women, and then how can we support mental health by talking about these three key points. Number one, getting clear on your boundaries, really defining what's okay and what's not okay. One of the things that really influences whether we are able to support and take care of ourselves is being clear on our boundaries. The second one is to redefine our role. If our world is different as it was 18, than 18 months ago, isn't it about time for us to relook 
at our role. And we're going to introduce to you this whoop structure for which we can think about what that role could look like. Last of all, supporting your mental health also means tapping into the communities around you. One of the things that has really kept me going is my family, my relatives who live about five to seven minutes near to me, and also my extended family that lives in the virtual world. So we are going to look at these three points. And then we'll leave some time for conclusion. So how significantly has the pandemic affected your mental health? We have a little poll for you to take part in, in which one refers to not at all, and five is that maybe the pandemic has turned your world upside down. <laughs> so please help me by voting in the poll. All right, so I'm seeing the numbers coming in. Let's get more of you uh, typing it in. Thank you. All right. Yep, maybe another 15 seconds on the clock. You know, when I look at these faces, I wonder, you know, what is the range of expressions that you have had throughout the pandemic? I know that at some point, I do feel my moment of joy, but at some points, I also have that three-star face for number five. <laughs> so maybe for some of you, uh, you have felt that way. And I want to assure you that, you know, even though you have felt that way sometimes, it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you and you are not alone. In fact, as we begin the discussion on mental health, we want to act understand that you know when we experience various emotions it is all part and parcel of the human condition of course we will be concerned if some of these feelings are prolonged over a period of time so let's take a look at the poll right and we can see that majority has fallen in number three which is about 40 percent of those of you who have answered um, some of you say that the pandemic has affected you quite a bit about eight percent um, in the number five and about 21 percent in the four and likely this is because you know, boundaries have been blurred between working from home. We haven't had the chance to connect with as many people as we want to. So that may have brought about a sense of isolation. And really maybe some of the things that we've always wanted to do, we have a little bit of restriction and that could have resulted in turning your world upside down. But we also have about 30% of you in the one to two zone, which means that you know, maybe it hasn't turned your world upside down. It has affected you in some way. But perhaps you have been able to find ways in which to cope and find ways to still resume some kind of normal living throughout the pandemic. Thank you for sharing in the poll. Um, it just wanted all of us to get a sense of where we are right now. So let's go on to the next slide and let's type the poll. So what has been the impact on women as a result of COVID-19? If we look at it, more women have lost their jobs or had pay cuts. More women are in frontline jobs, whether it's in the hospitals or in education. Now, I spend a lot of my time working with teachers and they do tell me that their mental health has been affected, particularly those who have to juggle uh, their families, uh, attending to their children's schoolwork while still trying to conduct lessons. As a parent myself, I have also felt that uh, you know, it has been quite a stretch for me having to navigate running my own business full time and yet having to look after my children. And I do sympathize and empathize a lot with the teachers. There was once I caught the teacher trying to do her lesson with three of her boys clamoring her head. And I just wondered whether she was able to even think and deliver the lesson properly. Thankfully, my daughter did tell me that she did pretty well. But the truth is, the impact has fallen on women more than men. It doesn't mean that men are not affected at all. It's just that disproportionately, the impact has fallen more on women. Women have had also to bear a larger proportion of the child caring and education duties at home, what we term as the second shift. After the first shift at work, sometimes they have to come home and attend to what the things that have to be done at home. So given that the impact on women has been significant, what can we do to support our mental health? One of the things we can do is to get clear on your boundaries. 
Now, this is something we've probably heard before. I guess the question is not so much what it is, but how do we actually implement it? And how do we actually communicate it to the people around us so that they are also clear of our boundaries? Now, boundaries are really important, right? They are guidelines, rules, or limits that a person creates so that we can define for ourselves what we need to take care of ourselves. And when we communicate it, we also let the people in our life know, hey, this is what works for me and this is what doesn't work for me. And in so doing, because of the communication, they also learn how to interact together with you. Maybe for some of you, it feels uh, almost ironic. Like, why is it people in my life don't really know me? Or maybe don't really know what, what I need? And the truth is, the pandemic has hit us and turned um, things on its head. And what used to work may not work anymore. And therefore, later we'll be talking a little bit about how we can redefine the rules. So why do we need to have these boundaries? On the one hand, we can better take care of our needs, a form of radical self-care, if you will. On the other hand, when we draw the boundaries, we are actually creating time, space, and energy to do the things that we want, to do the things that we love. Sometimes we want to say no, but we end up saying yes. And many a time that is prompted perhaps by the fear of judgment or the fear of other people thinking that we don't want to do certain things because of them. Sometimes we want to please the people in our lives because we want them to be happy. But in so doing, our cup gets drained. And one thing I know for sure is when our cup is drained, it is really hard for us to continue giving. And many of the ladies and people that I talk to share with me, you know, Sean, I'm so aware of my boundaries, but when push comes to shove, when it's time for me to really, uh, you know, implement it, I often get weak because, you know, what if, what if, what if? And if you're one of those in the audience thinking, it's so hard to really implement my boundaries, I want to give you some strategies to help you. The next reason why boundaries are really important is that it reduces the conflict in our relationships. Sometimes we rely a lot on existing mental models or assumptions of how our relationships are supposed to go. But if the external environment has changed, surely that could have impact on our relationships. Research has supported and found in the last 18 months that relationships could go one of two ways. One is that it could get enhanced when people have more time together to communicate and spend quality time bonding. A gentleman I met in a recent webinar told me that he is now having eat with your family day every single day when it used to be only once a month previously before the pandemic. And yet it could also cut the other way for families that aren't very close to begin with having to live in close quarters can really create more conflict. And because of that, if we want to preserve our relationships, if we want to strengthen the family, we've got to get clearer on our boundaries and learn how to communicate it. Sometimes you may think of this as being selfish, but what it really is, is self-care. So how do we actually determine our boundaries? Brené Brown has a beautiful quote, which I love so much. And that is, daring to set the boundaries is about having the courage to love ourselves even when we risk disappointing others. There's so much packed in that one statement. It begins with daring. It means that within us, we have to summon up the courage to get clear, first of all, on what works for us, what drains us versus what doesn't work for us what brings us joy. And then we need to then dig deep and bring up yet another set of courage to love ourselves. She has another quote that says, you know, whenever we say yes to others and no to ourselves, we are almost betraying ourselves. Learning to set boundaries is about self-love and valuing ourselves enough that when we say no, it doesn't mean we're saying no to the person. It means, for well, now, this doesn't work for me. I'm saying yes to myself, to my time, to my energy, and my own mental health. And yes, maybe along the way, we may risk disappointing others. But 
let me ask you another question. What if we disappoint, we don't disappoint others, but we end up betraying ourselves? Over the long run, that is going to feel even worse. So one of the ways she suggests that we determine our boundaries is to identify what's okay for us and what's not okay for us. Now, this could be in the workplace setting, or this could be in your home setting, or even in your interaction with your friends. In whatever setting, it is just as simple as this. I'm giving you some examples to think about, and maybe you may want to create your own list. In the what's okay column, I've put here, it's okay for someone to share how they feel with me. In fact, if they share it with me, I'm able to better understand and empathize where they are coming from. However, it's not okay if while sharing with me, they shout at me or put me down repeatedly. Now, when we are clear on what the not okay is and what the okay is, it means that when something that happens in the what not okay column comes up, we will immediately become aware and then we can prepare a response or we can at least let the person know that, hey, you know, when you said that earlier and, you know, it felt like you were putting me down and for me, that wasn't okay. And yes, at that point, you may feel scared. At that point, you may fear that they don't want to talk to you anymore. But imagine if you continue swallowing this. After some point, your self-esteem and self-worth will be affected. The second it's okay that I have there is it's okay for me to say no when it crosses my personal values. For example, if I'm asked to do something that I don't believe in, but yet maybe it puts me in front of a very big client, I might ask myself whether that's something I want to do. But if it crosses my values, quite likely I'm going to say no. What's not okay is if I say yes, when I mean to say no. And of course, there are times that we may waver and that's why we need to spend time on this exercise to really get clear. And when we are clear, the next step is to be able to communicate it with other people. Now, when it comes to communication, the first thing you wanna ask yourself is who needs to know what my boundaries are? It could be your team members at work. It could be your immediate supervisor. It could be your spouse. It could even be your children. It could even be your friends whom you spend a lot of time with. Sometimes they may assume that you always have time for them simply because of the role that you have always been playing. But with things being different now, perhaps it's time to reevaluate what those boundaries are and then be able to communicate them, to, to communicate the boundaries more clearly to them. Okay. So that's step number one, to protect our mental health. We have to get clear on our boundaries and then be able to communicate them. The second piece is to redefine your role. As I had mentioned earlier, when the external environment change, we also have to change. Sometimes this means that some people worry, do I have to change every aspect of my life? As it is, everything is so uncertain. Can't I just stay in my comfort zone and stay steadfast? And perhaps there will be some elements of you that remain the same. You're more ground, still grounded into your values. You know what your priorities are, but perhaps it is your role that you may need to redefine. Let's look at how women's roles have shifted over the years. Compared to the past, more women now are literate and pursuing higher education. More, more women now are working resulting in dual income households. What that means is perhaps more time at work and maybe less time at home, or if we're trying to work out some kind of harmony, then it could be finding creative ways in which we can still contribute to the family as we do to our workplace. More women are also in traditionally male-dominated industries like politics, senior leadership, and even the rising trend in data. So this gives us an opportunity. We may look at it as something that's getting in our way, but we could also look at it as an opportunity. An opportunity, first of all, to rethink about what is it we want to do. You know, very often people share with me that they're unclear about what they're here for, what their purpose is. First thing you can start thinking about 
if you're trying to redefine what is it you want to do, is to ask yourself, what are your strengths? What is it that people know you for? What is it that you feel excited to do every single day? What are your passions? And combining your strengths and passions, what do you use that to do in the communities around you? Perhaps your strength is creativity. Perhaps you use your creativity to inspire others. Or maybe your creativity sparks new ideas. Or perhaps your strength is in knowledge. And with that knowledge, you empower others. You enable others. Or maybe you find shortcuts with that knowledge. For you, it is an opportunity to redefine what is it you want to do. In the past, we used to ask questions such as, what job do we want to get in? Perhaps we can also begin to reframe the question. What is it we want to contribute to, given the strengths that we have? The second question, we can, second opportunity we have is to reassess where our priorities lie and what that would mean to us. I remember thinking about this when I was about to make the leap from being a full-time employee into being self-employed. At the time, my greatest priority was to be with my daughter. She was 10 months old, as I said, when we went overseas to study in UPenn. And at the time, I was already contemplating, maybe after I study, I could come back and start my own business. But when I shared this idea with the people in my life and also my friends, many of them said, are you sure? Um, it would be so risky to do that, Shan. You already have something stable. And perhaps in years to come, you could be at the top of your field if you just stay where you are. However, having the opportunity to be in a period of transition, perhaps as many of us are now, is an opportunity for us to be assessed where our priorities lie. And I asked myself deep down, what is it I really want at this point? What matters to me right now? And what mattered to me at that point was being able to be present for my daughter in the early years of her life. And so I made the leap into becoming self-employed. And though the first few years were very hard, I would never regret the time that I spent with her, seeing how she first took her first words, contributing um, to the family, learning how to cook, and doing all kinds of things for the family. I knew what my priorities were, and I really wanted to do something about it. So for you sitting right there, you may want to ask yourself, if you're thinking of things in black and white, it's either this or that, perhaps we can start thinking of plus. Could it be this and that? Let's lay down what these priorities are and consider creative ways to make the plus happen as opposed to either or. And don't forget to think about what that would mean to you. What would it mean if you are able to put those priorities in alignment with your values? How would you show up every single day? The third opportunity we have on our hands is to redefine what it means to be a woman in the various contexts we work and play in. Does work always have to be work? Can't we bring our fun and joy to work? Can we bring our authentic personalities into our work? There was a lady who shared with me that she was struggling because she didn't have enough time for a daughter. However, one day she watched as her daughter was trying to complete a school project. And from that school project, she had inspiration. She brought the concepts and the steps that her daughter took to complete the school project into her workplace. And everybody said, hey, where did you get this idea from? She gave a little small smirk and said, from my daughter, you guys. And everybody just cheered. Is it possible that as we have this opportunity presented to us, that we can redefine what it means to be a woman in the various contexts that we work and play? This is a challenge I'm putting out to you. So how can we begin to do this? I want to introduce to you a structure known as WHOOP. And WHOOP comes from Dr. Gabriel Oettingen. It is a goal-setting framework, but it helps us to think about potentials and possibilities, and also helps us to think about potential obstacles that might get in the way. 
So in order to use this framework, I'm giving you four guiding questions from each of the letters of the group. The first one is, if you had the opportunity to redefine your role, what do you wish for and what will it look like? If you are creative, you might want to have a big piece of paper, just like I do. I'm still pretty old school. And I take out a big piece of mahjong paper. I lay it on the floor with all my markers. And I try to write down everything that makes my heart sing. And that everything that I'm good at, my strengths. And I look at it all in one big picture. If you had the opportunity, and I think we all do, how would you redefine your role? What would you wish for? The second one is, what is the best result of feeling when that wish comes alive and comes true? How would you feel? Not just what would it look like, but how would you feel on the inside? You see, sometimes we disregard the way in which we feel towards a certain task that we do. Maybe even for some of us, we've gotten into the motion of saying, this is my agenda today, this is my to-do list, Today, and I'm just going to plow, you know, kind of plow through it. But every single thing that we do comes with how we feel about it and how much energy we get from it. What is the best outcome when that wish or uh, uh, wish comes alive or comes true for you? The next part is very practical, and that is to think about the obstacles that could get in your way. When I first wanted to transition into being self-employed. The first obstacle I thought about was, what if I don't make any money in the first year? And because I thought about that particular obstacle, I started saving up my money about two or three years ahead of time so that in the event that I didn't have, I, I didn't make any money, I would at least have my savings to tide me and my daughter by. I also had an internal obstacle, which was, what if this doesn't work? What if? I'm just not good enough to run a business. What if nobody wants to listen to me speak? Knowing that obstacle ahead of time, I made sure that I sought advice and resources from people who had been in the industry before me. I went for certification courses to build up my confidence and my competence and my knowledge. You see, people think that thinking about obstacles ahead of time means we are pessimistic. But what it is actually tied in with our wish is a sense of realistic optimism, having hope for the future, but yet being practical about it. So in the second O, I encourage you to think about potential obstacles. Think about external obstacles, but also think of internal obstacles, your mindsets, your attitudes. Maybe some of us have um, certain mental models from years and years ago that could be blocking our way. It's a good time for us to look at that. And then last of all, P, which is to plan. Plan ahead how you intend to overcome these obstacles so that when or if the obstacle does come, we have plan A, plan B, plan C. First of all, it gives us some assurance that, hey, we know how we are going to take action should something come in a way that reduces the anxiety and allows us to give ourselves a chance. Second of all, as I said, if one plan fails, you have plan B. If one plan fails, you have plan C. This is hope inducing. And if we're looking to redefine our role, we need to do it with positive emotion. We need to do it knowing that we have got a pathway in place. And finally, that we'll know what to do when things happen. So hopefully, point number two has been inspiring for you. We have an opportunity here, I believe, to redefine our role. And using the WHOOP structure, hopefully that will help you to have a plan forward as you start thinking about what that is for you. Okay, so on to the final point. I love this empowered women, empower women, or even for the gentlemen in the audience, empower each other. Tapping into the communities around you has been one of the most valuable strategies for me. Sometimes we take it for granted that they will always be there and that we don't need to nurture it, or that maybe our community 
we, we don't really know what we can get out of our communities. I'm not saying join a community just to make use of it, but recognize that communities can add great value to our mental health because it, during the sharing in your communities, you get to learn, number one, that you're not alone. You get to learn different perspectives of how people think, and that gives you greater insight, perhaps greater empathy, and also perhaps you discover that there's some common ground, and that common ground can give you the boost that you need, particularly if you're feeling disconnected, maybe you feel that you're struggling by yourself. Tapping into the communities, number one, could mean pursuing your interests and joining communities around you. One thing I will ask you to begin with is to not look too far away. Look in your most immediate environment, whether it's your most immediate virtual environment or your most immediate physical environment. For me, one of the things that I've done most recently is to join my neighborhood committee. Since we're spending so much time at home, I ask myself, where can I contribute? And I realized, hey, right where I'm living. I joined the community and we've been supporting and helping the people here who need access to information about COVID, uh, communicating some of the uh, many changes that have come, and even supporting the elderly who may not want to get their vaccinations by talking to them and hoping uh, to you know, at least be connected with them. Many of them live alone. And by doing that, I feel more connected to the place that I live in. When I walk around the park, I see familiar faces. What are some communities around you that you can join? What are some interests that you have that perhaps you can kickstart by sharing with your friends? Or perhaps they already have certain interests in which you can join. I know that here in Singapore and even in different regions, people have started forming gardening committees <laughs> and also cycling communities because we can't travel by plane, so might as well take to the road. The second point on the communities is to celebrate and support fellow women. Now, this concept is not exactly super familiar to me. I came from a girls' school, and unfortunately, for many years in the girls' school, I was bullied. My impression of girls and women is that they're out to get me. However, thankfully, after that four years of incredibly difficult experience, it was also a fellow lady who pulled me out of it by being nurturing, by being supportive, by being an exemplar of what it means when women support women. And because of her, I managed to walk away from the police and now spend a lot of time empowering other women. If you have a chance and you see a fellow lady doing good work, why not celebrate? Go up to her and say, hey, I really love what you're doing. Or, hey, I saw that you did this the other day. Wow, that is awesome. The more we celebrate and support, the rising tide can raise all things. Last point is consider how you can contribute your strengths to the people around you. Sometimes we think of things as giving or taking. Now, perhaps we can play both roles. We can give into our communities and we can take from our communities. Remember that your strengths are unique to who you are. And just like you thought about your strengths to redefine your role, you can also consider what are your strengths in regards to the people around you. Last year, when the first lockdown first happened, I read of a news report about people in Singapore and also in other regions really having difficulty putting food on the table. And I asked myself, hey, Sean, what are my strengths? I can't really cook. I can't really bake. I can't sew masks. But what I can is I can talk and I have knowledge on positive psychology. So I put together a few of the, my friends who are well-versed in the area of mental health. And we ran a series of webinars to raise funds. It was the first time I'd ever done something like this. I didn't know where it was going to go. I didn't know how much money was going to be raised. But we managed to raise $5,000. I was grateful to have like-minded people to join me. So one thing I want to leave you with for this segment is consider how you can contribute your strength to the people around you. While you think that means that you're giving, actually, you're also receiving. 
contributing has also been found to be supportive of our well-being because it connects us to things that we find meaningful, things that we find purposeful. So I hope that um, tapping to communities is a point that has resonated with you as well. So to round it all up, in summary, we started off the talk by talking about the context in which we have been in over the last 18 months. Our mental health has been affected, not just women, also men, but maybe disproportionately towards the women. And as a result, that may have affected the family environment. I know one thing, that if the core people in the family are affected, the surrounding people around them, the circles of influence around them are also affected. And that really gives me conviction to let you know that if you're taking care of yourself, it doesn't mean that you are selfish. Supporting your own mental health in a form of radical self-care is really important, not just for you, but also the family around you. In summary, to support your mental health, I shared with you about getting clear on your boundary, what is okay versus what's not okay. And once you're clear about that, to learn how to communicate it with the people matter. And remember, it is an act of courage. It is an act of vulnerability. But as it is, we have been through a whirlwind. Perhaps it's time to talk about courage, maybe one step at a time and think, who needs to know what my boundaries are? And always remember that it isn't just selfish. I see a question, we'll come to that later. It isn't about being selfish. It is about being kind to yourself and being kind to others as well. Second point, redefine your role, use the whoop structure and be realistically optimistic. Last of all, tap into the communities around you. You never know who's around, who has similar interests as you, you never know how your strengths are going to benefit someone who may be of greater need. And last of all, you never know how that is going to be beneficial as well for you and your mental health. So thank you for being here today. I hope that the uh, talk has given you much needed inspiration and Maybe it's time to take some questions. <laughs> I see some interesting uh, questions over here. Maybe I can address the question number one, which is, you know, how can we manage the boundaries between what is selfish and what is self-care? I think before I answer the question, we want to ask ourselves, how do we define each term? Perhaps we also want to ask ourselves why we think self-care is selfish. Perhaps there are messages from when we were younger, when we were told, you know, care about others, be kind to others. And sometimes when we did something for ourselves, it was labeled as being selfish. The way in which we tried to cope with that was that we, we negated our own needs and turned towards others. And perhaps it's just become a pattern of how we have done things. In order for us to manage the boundaries, we first need to understand what selfish means to us and what self-care looks like to us. And of course, there are tools in which we can determine whether, you know, what is the difference between selfish and self-care. But I would ask you to spend some time with yourself and ask yourself, hey, when I take care of myself, what does that look like? What does that feel like? And then in the middle, another column is to also identify when I've done this, perhaps someone has told me that it is selfish. And ask yourself now, is that what you believe now? As I said, you have an opportunity to relook at it, to re-examine it. And if to you, that is taking care of itself, then perhaps we need to reshift re our mindset from selfish to self-care. Hopefully that helps to answer question number one. Okay, um, all right, let me see this question. What are some beginner tips you have for someone who is struggling with setting boundaries uh, for fear of setting those around them? Well, maybe it is about thinking about what happens if you don't do it versus what happens if you do. 
very often fear is there to protect us. Fear tells us that, hey, you know, you are doing something that you're not used to doing. And because of that, it has become an internal mechanism. And in some way, we self-sabotage. So we need to be aware of that, number one. Number two, we ask ourselves, what if we didn't communicate the boundary? And sometimes we fear that we fear and we perceive the outcome, and sometimes the outcome is, well, that we perceive will be far worse than what it actually is. We can ask ourselves some defining questions. Number one, is our fear a certainty or is it a possibility? Number two, is the person 100% going to react the way that he or she is, or is it just something that we believe and perceive? Very often, we think of the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario often looks like that, rejection and uh, fear of upsetting. And that comes back to our fundamental need. We want to be accepted. We want to be connected to other people, right? And because of that, we struggle with our boundaries. But I also urge you to think on the other hand, what could be the best possible scenario? And if you want, go extreme with it. Perhaps the best possible scenario is that the person says, wow, I didn't know that. Thank you for telling me. Your mind is not going to agree with you at this point because that internal mechanism is blocking. However, when you look at the worst possible scenario and you look at the best possible scenario, what is likely to happen is something in between a little bit of the worst, maybe they'll have a first reaction like, huh? But then there could be a little bit of the best as well, where they actually understand if we are able to communicate it well and give reasons why this is really important. And if they, are, if they matter to you as much as you matter to them, they would listen to you and understand. You. But what it means is that we have to begin by trying. We have to step forward. And even though we feel a little bit of fear, we try it because if we don't try it, we won't really know what their response is. And all we have is what we think they're going to say. Okay, hopefully that helps. Um, let me see. I think we still have time for a question. I do have someone who has raised a hand. Jasmine, do you want to ask your question, Jasmine? Or type it in the chat. Um, yes, <laughs> I'm seeing another question about would this be considered as um, selfish? Can I share a story to try to answer that? Maybe that would help. Um, so I mentioned to you that I went to the University of Pennsylvania to study and what I didn't say was that halfway through my course, uh, my husband who, was, who had to come back to work, I had finished his course and he came back. Um, and we, I mean, he had to come back and we had to make a decision to stay there for six months when he had no income and I was on no pay leave or come back where he could continue to work and my daughter would have some support and I would um, fly up and down to the US to finish up my studies. And we chose the second option. So for five months, I flew up to the US to attend my course on a Thursday night, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday in class, and on a Monday morning, I would fly back 26 hours back here to Singapore. It was absolutely exhausting, and I don't want anyone to ever have to go through that. On one of the flights, my mother-in-law came to look after my daughter, and my daughter was crying. And she said to me, you know, you already have a degree. Do you really need to go? Look, your daughter is crying. Now that is a moment where I asked myself, I could stay and I could be with my daughter and everybody would say, that's great because I'm being a responsible mother. However, if I stay, it would mean that I'm not being true and authentic to myself. It was a painful, painful dilemma. On the one hand, I didn't want her to keep crying. But on the other hand, I asked myself, why am I doing this? in the first place. I wanted to go and study because it's something that I'm passionate about. It was the first time in a long time I was doing something for me. If I were to be authentic, I should go because I want my daughter to also know that you know, doing something for myself is 
important just as she is. And so with a very heavy heart, he left on the plane. I was crying all the way, thinking of what a irresponsible and guilty mother that it was. However, when I arrived in uh, UPenn, I shared this pain and dilemma I had with my friends. And they said, you know, Sean, you have been a mother and you still will be and you always have been. You always put her first. How about it's time to put yourself first? Wouldn't they want a mother who is energized, who is excited, who loves what she does every single day? And yes, culturally, that was not something I was used to. But one thing I learned is that we need perspective. We need to also ask ourselves, who's living our life? We can continue giving in to our culture. And yes, it may be a bit stressful to live that way. Or we can continue, or we can decide to do something for ourselves. That brings a different kind of stress. Both choices may not look desirable, but we need to make a choice what matters to us. And then go back to the class and say, is there a way that we can blend the two? Is there a way that we can communicate to our loved ones? that this is what we want to do. And if they should object, I think we go back again and we explain to them how much it matters to us. It may not be immediate conversion, maybe not conversion at all, but we at least try. Hopefully that story helps to answer the question. <laughs> I know there's a lot of people uh, asking questions, raising hands, but I also do think I'm out of time. <laughs> so maybe I'll just hand it back over to uh, the organizer. Thank you so much, Shain. This was a very engaging and inspiring session and indeed we could listen to you for the entire day. Thanks so much for sharing the personal stories as well. I'm sure everyone in the audience enjoyed as much as we did. I think we have the next session starting soon. Uh, for the next session, we will have um, we'll have uh, Gurmit Singh, um, the Singaporean, uh, our artist host who will uh, talk about um, mental health, his own mental health struggles, um, and he will share that you're not alone in this. Um, this this is going to be a pre-recorded session, uh, so um, we won't be able to take questions. But um, I hope you will enjoy it because it's 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 really interesting. Uh, to hear Gurmit Singh share about his uh, own mental health experience. So um, I think my, my colleague Walston will share screen and um, enjoy uh, watching the pre-recorded session. <laughs>